So thank you all for uh, being here. Thank you, uh, Sergey, for giving me uh, the opportunity to speak to all of you. And when you told me uh, we have this colloquium, uh, I was okay. I decided to to, to tell you more about one of the problem. One of the problems I've been mostly wrapping my head around for the last 10 years. So this is this notions of graphs, oh well, of points and lines. It's, well, I've been introduced to this when I was a postdoc of um, Vashek Shvatal in Montreal 10 years ago, right, yeah, something like that. And well, at that time it was just one question and it became Many, many, many questions. Most of them are open. Well, a lot of them are open. We close some of them in Agda some, sometimes. I will try to speak in English, but I might have some Russian reminiscences. And um, so here I will just make a recap of all the framework we are working in and then give you an overview of the recent results, well they have to be recent because it's like 10 years ago and uh, well mainly open questions that we I want to share with you if it strikes the interest of anyone here I would be glad to continue this way so uh, we will be talking of points and lines mainly in different contexts and the context will be graphs, metrics and betweenness from the closest context to the widest the main question of today is this one. So if I give you n points in some context and I want to know how many lines are defined by these endpoints. And the hint or like the answer that we would like to get is that we expect many such lines. <laughs> by many we mean at least n most of the time. Okay? So this is the main question for today, I will, maybe we will see this slide once or twice, but like this is the main question. If you want to have one open question, this is this one. And I want to, as I told you already, I want to give you an overview of the results that we had or that have been obtained by different colleagues around and the open questions around that uh, field. And concerning open questions, we also expect many of them, actually, and there is some. All right, so first, I would like to bring you to this field like, uh, thoroughly and start with this question. So I have a set of points in the plane. Let's take the Euclidean plane, and I will define, so this set of points, here I have five of them, they define some lines. So if I take any two points, and draw a line between two of them, I get this picture. In this picture, you can see that there are two, well, there's six lines, but there is two types of lines. So in the plane, if I want to define a line, I say that it's defined by two points. Whenever I have two points, I have one line. So here I have this line, which is actually defined by two points, so it's like the ordinary view of a line. But this one, well, it's defined by any two of this one, but it has three points on it. So we will say that those ordinary lines are the lines that we expect, the, the lines with only two points. And this one are kind of really is like weird, like it's some degenerancy of the, of the, of the um, space. And we will call them extraordinary lines, okay? One of the early questions in this topic was given, well, was asked by James Sylvester. Some of you may know already about him. By the end of uh, the 19th century, so it was quite a while ago, he basically, well, not in these terms, but he basically asked, if I give you endpoints in the plane, well, they could be all collinear, and then we would have just one extraordinary line, but like super extraordinary. Or they could be non-collinear. So we, fo we forbid this all-inner line situation. And the question is, is it true that there is at least one green line, one ordinary line in this picture? So it was asked in uh, Educational Times. 
journal for nobody knows if he had the answer or not. Was well, just a challenge, a riddle, or something? Well, it was like the paternity of the result. So we have this theorem now by the uh, by in the 30s, and the paternity is given to Sylvester and Galai. So this is the Sylvester Galai theorem, which says whenever I get endpoints which are not collinear, then there is at least one ordinary line. So the proof of Tibor Galai uh, is maybe more technical than this question has been like um, as rebirth in the 40s through Paul Erdős, and there's been many different proofs of it, of this result. And the one which is like kind of beautiful or in a sense uh, rewarding or uh, is approved by Kelly, so I will just show you this one because it's kind of a nice one if you don't know it, if you already know it, please bear with me. So the point is we know that there is no line with everything on it. So for every line there is at least one point which is outside of it. Take a line L, there must be a point out of it, outside of it, take the closest one. So we find a line L and a, and a point P which is closest to L, and we assume that among all the pairs, line points, everything is finite. Sorry, maybe I didn't say that, but so all, everything is finite for us. So we take all the pairs, line and point outside, and choose the one which minimizes this distance here. And basically, I'm claiming that this line must be ordinary. So if it's ordinary, then I'm done. I have proved that I have an ordinary line. If it's not, well, it means that I have at least three points on this line, and if I take this orthogonal here, I divide my line into two parts, so one of which must have at least two points. So this is pigeonhole principle. So let's assume that we have two points on the right hand side. Well, this is a point from my context, so this is a line that I should have been considering, and if I look at this point, it is outside of this line, and it is definitely strictly closer than this one. So this is a contradiction with my hypothesis that I took the minimum distance, okay? So this is a really, just draw this on the board, it's, everybody can understand this proof. It's very specific to the Euclidean plane, so it's not like the most, like, Whenever you have a proof, you try to, you have your result and you want to extend it to several frameworks. This is not really extendable. Still, it's a nice proof, so I think everybody should know about this. I'm advertising for this proof. Sorry, so, okay, so that was the proof that for every non-collinear set of points, there is an ordinary line. And the, the, then you have several ways of generalizing these questions is can we say that there is many ordinary lines and how many ordinary lines are there? And there was a conjecture which was called the dirac modskin conjecture that if, you give, if you're given a set of points which are not all collinear, then you don't just have one ordinary line but you have many of them. By many of them is n over two asymptotically. And it was uh, proven recently, like in 2013 by Green and Tao that when your n is large enough, you have your n over 2 ordinary lines, and even more than that, if n is odd, you get 3 fourths of n ordinary lines, so you have even more than that. Don't ask me any technical question about the proof. I don't really know the details of it, but it's been quite a nice result in that field. But our question is not about ordinary lines, it's about number of lines. So we, we count also the red ones. We count the green ones and the red ones. So once again, how many lines are defined by endpoints? If we come back to our uh, first example, we have five points, as I told you already. And if I count the line, I get six lines. Okay. So question, if I have endpoints, how many lines should I get? What, what, how, how large can be, can be this, and how small can it be? If I want an upper bound, so let's say that we have endpoints on the plane, or endpoints, let's say on the plane, 
and M lines. If I want an upper bound on M, well, it's pretty basic. You just take a general situation and you have N choose two possible lines. Every pair of generators give you one new line. If I want to, so this is for the upper bound, forget about it. If I want a lower bound, as we told, this is one when everybody is collinear. And when you ask to forget about this everything on one line situation, like the first, if I give you a piece of paper and a, and a, a karandash, I yeah, forgot the name, okay, a pen, sorry, pen and paper. So you just, the first drawing that you have is this one, so I will just remove one point from the line. And I get this near pencil, which is one line with n minus one point, one point outside, and you get n minus one lines this way, so you get your count of n lines. It's not a proof that it's always the case. You might think that by putting points in a different manner, you may get smaller number of lines. But for the Euclidean case, so if this is the publication that somehow renewed the interest on the question. So the first question, so this is the other in uh, 43, and he has two questions. The first is the same question as Sylvester. So if I have n points with the property that any line between two of them goes through at least a third one, so if all the lines are extraordinary, then show that all of them are on a s or collinear. So this is like a rephrasing of the same question. And the second point is our question. If I have n points which are not on the same line, so I forget this one, then uh, he wants to prove that I have at least n distinct lines. And if you know already what we, where we're going on, where we're going, so like the, the second point is kind of a corollary from the first one. In this way, oh, sorry. So it was proved by De Bruyne and Erdős. Actually, this is kind of a mistake, but most of the time I will be speaking about De Bruyne Erdős property as having the situation that either I have a line which covers everything, or I have many lines, lines being more than n. Because we thought that this is what they proved. Actually, they prove much more than that. They, they prove that if I have they prove it in a combinatorial way. They, they don't deal with the plain thing. And in a combinatorial way, you, they say, if I have a family of points and a family of sets on this family of points, if any pair of points appears in exactly one set, so this is this notion if I have two points that generate a line, and this line is unique, then the family has size at least n, or it has uh, somehow one set that contains them all. So they prove kind of something bigger than just the Euclidean case. But if we stick to the Euclidean case, we can see that the result from above is we can straightforwardly get the, the result for the plane. So what was our result is if all the points are not collinear, then I have an ordinary line. I have a green line, which has only two points on it. So take this line. We say we know that there is such a line. There is two points on this. Let's consider just one of them. So I have a big set of points. Not all of them are collinear. We know that there is an ordinary line. Just take this point and remove it from the set. So now I have n minus one point here. They define some set of lines. By induction, we know that either they are all collinear. In that case, we get this near pencil drawing that we saw earlier. So I have n minus one point this way, and n minus one lines going through, so I get my result. Or they define at least n minus one lines. And among these n minus one lines, I cannot get this green line, because it has only one point on it in this set. Okay. So this is like the whole thing. Here we are in the 40s, and we get this. So you just uh, do the two cases, and you get the result in general. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so one of the main things that we do is generalizing stuff. So 
let's try to generalize the concept of line. So what is a line? So right now we are used to this line in the plane, everything's fine. Basically a line is defined by two points, so I have my two generators, A, a and B. And if I want to define the line, I will just add the segment AB, so which is all the points which are between. Right now I didn't really define what, must, what means between, but I mean we all have an instinct about what, uh, what does it mean to be between. And then we also add that the line is infinite to this both ways. And so what is, how can I characterize those points on the right? Well, this is the point X. If I want to use this between, between the situation, this is the point X such that B is between A and X. If I take any point here, B lies in between those. Things. And if I consider the points which are there, it's all the X's such that A is between both of them, okay? So now I have not changed anything. Right now I'm still speaking on the plane, but I just defined the concept of line with only using betweenness, or this notion of betweenness. So this is how we go to what is a betweenness, and let's try to somehow be more uh, interested in that. So the, the okay. So what does it mean in the plane to be between? It means that the distance from A to X plus the distance from X to B is equal to the distance between A and B. This is just the, the triangular inequality being tight. And this is the first obvious notion of betweenness. As soon as you have a metric space, you can speak of betweenness. So this is in the works of Menger in the 30s, well, no, the 20s actually, where uh, you get this notion of, so if you have a metric space, I guess, I'm not really an expert in German stuff, but whenever I have this equality, so this is exactly this notion of being between. And it, basically it says, we have this metric space in the Euclidean case, but you can get any metric, metric space now, and you have this notion of betweenness, so you can speak of a line, basically. So if I look at those metric space, let's stick to the plane R2. Well, I have this, if I take the L2 metric, then the, the segment is this. Uh, I have like, if I have two points, the set of points between those two ones is the red segment. But as soon as I change the metric, I have new ways of new sets of seg new segments. Mm. So L1, like the Manhattan distance, you get the, the, the whole rectangle except when, well, you, have, you get the rectangle, basically, if it's not degenerate. If I take L infinity, I get a rectangle which is kind of uh, twisted to 45 degrees. And so these are, well, uh, you can play with uh, your favorite metrics on L2. You can go to RD, whatever. Another context where we have uh, metrics is a notion of graphs, so I, I assume that everybody know what is a graph, so I have a set of vertices and edges. And the metric induced by a graph is just the notion of shortest path in terms of number of edges. I, I'm talking about unweighted graphs here. So I have a graph, let's say C5, and I look at shortest path, and I can say here that the yellow vertex is between the two red vertices, because there is a shortest path from there to there, that go through this CL1, okay? But this guy here is not between those two ones because shortest path go through this thing. All right, so this is your usual betweenness induced by a metric. So we're still in the, in the field of Karl Menger. I, just, I have a metric, so I have a betweenness. But actually, we can see betweennesses in other situations, one of which is this one which is that I find just interesting in terms of uh, philosophical interest. I don't know what we can do with it, but so in his posthumous book, so I think it, well, he died three years before the, the publication, director, Direction of Time, Hans Reichenbach gives this notion of causal betweenness. So if I have a, some probabilities, probabilistic events, here I have event B, 
we will say that it is between events A and C if the following things occur. So let me just at least speak of these two ones, which are the most interesting one and which explains what's going on. This basically tells us that A and C are not independent. So we have some dependency between those two events. And this basically tells us that knowing B, they are independent. So somehow we have a de uh, some dependence between A and C before if B does not occur, or if we don't know anything about B. But as soon as B occurs, then we have a dependency. So somehow it, B is an event which breaks the dependency between those two events. And so this can be seen as a notion of being causally between those two guys. I think that some people are writing, so I will wait. <laughs> I mean, this is the only slide I will be talking about this because I'm not a probabilistic expert, but I don't know. I mean, that's something that I read now and then, and I will think, well, it's, at least it is nice. So we have some betweenness in probabilistic sets. Let me go through. Then, so I didn't find any picture for Robert, so let's just stick to what he write. And if I have a partial order, any partial order, I have an obvious notion of betweenness, which is that y is between x and z if I have these inequalities or if I have those inequalities. In this paper, uh, so in the 60s, uh, Boomkrod gives more than that. If you have a lattice, so you, have, you don't just have this uh, partial order, you get some uh, plus and multiplicative, uh, well, join and meet, depending on your um, origins. He gives some uh, various notions of betweenness. Actually, he gives a list maybe of 20 or so. I just give an extract here. So we say that y is between x and z if I have these equalities, blah, blah, blah. But it somehow provides many several betweennesses which are not coming from a metrics kind point of view. And so let's stick to uh, when I uh, was introduced to betweenness, this is very simple. I say that a betweenness is a ternary relation, so I have a set of points, and I say that B is between A and C. I will write A, B, C is in the ternary relation, and the only thing I require, basically, is that I, I have this symmetry. Like if B is between A and C, I want B to be between C and A. That's just the only thing that we ask. Then we want to speak about strict betweenness, so we will add this notion of all the points must be distinct. So we could say that A is between A and C, but we try to refrain from this situation. Okay? So now. Sorry, this slide shows that if you have such big requirement, only this axiom, uh -huh. so we, we got some reasonable notion of betweenness. Well, we can actually, well, this is how, what, what is reasonable notion of betweenness? This is basically what we, what they were trying to find. What must, what is the, 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 the core of being between stuff? What does it mean to be between? And they came to this one. We will see later that there is, so there is a, this is quite very, this is very weak. This is just, just symmetry basically. Uh, so, as you can as you can guess, you don't get many results for general betweennesses. Most of the case, we want to focus on some subsets of betweennesses. And what is strange? It's called strict betweenness. Strict because we want them to be pairwise distinct. This is why we say strict. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah. Because the condition looks very weak. And yeah. It's strict. Uh, okay, yeah. So strict is just for the pairwise distinct thing. But uh, you're right. We should. Well, at least it's not called strong betweenness. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Okay, so let me just tell you if, if if we come back to the concept to the notion of graphs. So I told you about this metric betweenness. This is the usual one, the one that we think naturally. But actually, there are different betweennesses, which is like the monophonic betweenness. I will say that. 
Like the thing that we talk about is I have two points. If I have a path with no chord, so with no shortcut between those two points, then all the elements of the path are said to be between in the monophonic sense. Uh, these two elements, these two red elements. So this gives you a new notion of betweenness in the world of graphs. So all this uh, lattices, betweennesses that I've been talking about are also a new notion of betweenness that don't come from metric. Here, if we want to play just a second, if I take these two points, well, they generate, like, those two guys are between them, but this one is also between them. So somehow this line, the line defined, defined by, even the segment defined by these two guys, is the whole graph. So, Let's come back to our uh, genera generalization of lines. As I told you, when I wrote about this, I said we have A and B. And now, instead of a segment, I just make a big potato, which is all the points that can be seen between A and B, all the points that can be on the left, and all the points which, which can be on the right. So it's suddenly we have a wider range of lines. And for before step, it's okay, just now we will shortly have some results or some questions. But just to be aware that our uh, intuition might fool us. Oh, there's a question for you, I guess. <laughs> so, how lines do behave? I mean, if I have, let's take this graph, that's an easy one. I have uh, C5, five vertices. Question, what is now the line defined by A and C? So I take A and C, what is the line? Well, the segment is everybody between them. So there is just, I'm back to the metric system. So I take the, the shortest path thing. So between A and C, there is only vertex B. And we can see that E cannot be seen on the left or on the right part of the line. So once again, just recall that I have this, but I also must take care of those guys on the left or on the right. So could it be that E is grasped from the right hand side? No, because this is definitely not the shortest path. Like the shortest path to A is there and the shortest path to C is there. And symmetrically, this guy is not in the line neither. So the line AC. So now you are use uh, graph metrics. Yes, right now I am sticking to graph metrics. So the the line AC is just those three points. Mm -hmm. Now if I switch to the line BC, so I take these two points. What is the segment between B and C? Well, there's nothing. There's nothing in between them. But suddenly A is grasped from this way. D is grasped from this way, and this is left apart because there is a shortest path to this and to this, so the distances don't work. So the line BC is equal to ABCD, and that's it. What can we see? I have at least two weird situations here. First, like I have two distinct lines which have more than one intersection point. Just something, so it can be wild. Uh, I have uh, this situation, and more than that, I have one line which is strictly included in another line. So I don't even have this notion of, so I have two weird situations which are, intersection can be more than one point, and two, like if we come back to the notion of uh, De Brun Erdoche, they said that every pair of points was in exactly one line. And this is definitely wrong. Here I have A and B, which are in two different lines. So just to have a picture, so still we're happy. We have many different lines by your rotation that everything is symmetric. I get 10 distinct lines from this, from this situation. OK, so we went from the basic notion of line that we know to something which is kind of a bit wilder, and we get to try to think about those lines. Okay, so now we want to study those situ this situation. And so we jump to the Osnovnonye Bluda. What was about the 
So we went from the classic notion of line that we are used to, to a weird, so now, ah, you, sorry, this is what you, no, ah, okay, so what now uh, the picture is lines are now quite a mess. This is what I want to illustrate. I went from lines that we get pretty straightforwardly to uh, wild terrain where lines can intersect in many different ways. So you don't discuss complete contribution of this person? Yet. No, no, no. Okay. It's a pay. <laughs> he didn't make any, so it's Jackson Pollock who, like, maybe it was a contribution. We don't, we still don't know. Maybe it will be, it will provide. So, back to the main question. I told you that we will see this one several times. How many lines are defined by endpoints? Definition. So now I, I, I start from a betweenness. So I have a set X and this ternary relation or this notion of betweenness, basically, just think of betweenness. From this, we know that we can define the notion of line. This is all the points that are between and on the left and the right. And we will say that such a space has the De Bruyne-Erdős property. So this is what we want by saying either there is a line that contains everything. This is somehow saying the whole space is collinear. It's not really equivalent, but I want to prove that either, well, I don't want to prove, I say that it's DBE. I will say DBE quite often instead of De Bruyne-Erdős, but we have a line which contains everything or we have many lines. Many lines being at least the number of points in my situation. Okay. So the, the main question, how many lines we want, is basically I give you a betweenness space and I want to prove, does it have the De Bruyne-Erdős property? This is now the, the main question. And the conjecture, which actually was formulated as a question first, and by lack of counterexample, it became a conjecture after a few years. Uh, so this is the conjecture by, Schwattal and, by Shen and Schwattal. So Shen is a was a student of Schwattal and blah, blah, blah. So we won't go through the whole story. But basically, they claim, or no, they think that whenever this betweenness situation comes from a metric space, in the sense that whenever I have this triangular equality, I have this betweenness thing. So for every metric space, the notion of lines that I define satisfies the DBE. So either there is a line that goes through everybody, or there is many different lines. And there is a weaker thing, like this is all metric spaces, finite metric spaces. And here I will just look at the metrics which are induced by graphs. So I'm taking a subset of the metrics. So we have all the betweenness, the one which are metric, and the one from graphs. And so the conjecture is about metrics. And the weak conjecture, which is still white. So here are your two first big open questions. They are still unresolved. Like even for graphs, we don't know the, that they have this DBE property. And this general mean. Uh, here you have this condition from triple with only one observer. Yeah, asymmetry. sure. And so no, here we, uh, we will see that here we know that it's not true. We have some general betweennesses which don't follow this DBE. But we have, well, we'll I will come to this. So as I said, is a graphic metric space if it comes from a graph. So this is that situation here. And the uh, betweenness is said metric if it arises from some metric space. So this is just to give names to this thing here. And I have actually one step further. This is, once again, some silly observations, but written in a uh, well, it's kind of unreadable, but let's say that if I take a betweenness, so this was observed by Menger already, any betweenness from a metric, they satisfied several things. So this is just being strict, so all of them are distinct. Sorry, why uh, all points should be distant? We have an equality. Yes, you're uh, right. The distance between A and A is zero. Sure, you're right. So we, we try to, so this is why it's called M0. It's kind of a facultative, it's not mandatory. It depends how you want to speak about your betweenness, but if we stick to the strict betweennesses, so we want them to be distinct, so we add this M0, 
But the most important thing is that we have this symmetry. So this is basically these two things are strict betweenness. This is the widest thing you can get. This is telling us that if I have V between U and W, then W cannot be between U and V. This is in the general concept of betweenness, we may have this situation that we in intertween everything. And this is some form of transitivity. So if I have a shortest path from U to W that goes through V, and the shortest path from U to X that goes through W, so that means that I have all of them aligned. So I have U to W through V, and I have U to X. And I know that it goes through V in a metric space. This is the shortest path too. So basically, I have all. So this is transitivity property, basically. But so every metric space, every metric betweenness satisfies those four axioms or these four properties. But it's not an equivalence. So there are some betweenness that satisfy this and which don't arise from a metric. So we call this. Mm, Betweennesses that satisfy those four axioms, we call them pseudometric betweenness. And this gives us a third step or something like that. And so this is the four frameworks that I want to tell you about now. So we have four frameworks. We don't know four graphs if all graphs satisfy DBE. We don't know for metric spaces. We don't know for pseudometric betweennesses. The only thing that is sure is that general betweennesses don't follow in, well, in biggest generality. We have some counterexample here. But all these three points are wide open. So I will jump to the questions. So this is already three questions here that we will get some uh, closer questions, or easier, I don't know. So let's warm up on the graph situation, and let's take a graph which is bipartite. So I have a graph, bipartite, it means I can, basically it means that there is no odd cycle in there. So I have a graph without any odd cycle, which is connected so that this metric gives some sense. I don't want any two points to have infinite distance between them. So let's consider an edge, UV, and now take a point D, a third vertex, which is at distance K from U. Then the distance of Z to V can be of three values, basically. So I'm in a graph. If I am, if I am at distance K from U, my distance to V, as this is an edge, must live within these three values. What happens if the value if L equals K minus one. So I have length K minus one here. This makes a path of length K. So if I do this, I have a path of length K. So this means that Z is in the line UV by this shortest path. Like V is between U and V. Same situation here. Then this becomes the shortest path. And so the only situation for Z to not be in the line UV is to be at the same distance, like k, k plus 1. This makes a 2k plus 1 cycle, so this is a not cycle right here. We know that this cannot happen because we are in the bipartite graph. So basically, any edge in a bipartite graph gives us a universal line, so taking everything. So this is saying, so once again, dBE means either there is a line which contains everything or there is many lines. And this, we just proved that any edge gives us a line which contains everything. So all the bipartite graphs satisfies what we want. Good news. And then starts the crawling for larger and larger graph classes. So in the first paper, that, that's a lot of people. So we wrote this in 2011, I guess. And then it was like in a journal that takes time. So anyway, for causal graphs, so causal graphs is those graphs with simply short vertices or with no cycle, with no big cycles induced. So we managed to prove that this class satisfies the DBE. It's kind of a structural theorem where um, 
we see that if two lines are equal, we have some cut vertex, and we use these cut vertices to, to build on that, basically. I don't want to, to go too deep in the details because we have some better result after. So this is for chordal graphs. Yeah. Sorry, for chordal <coughs> graphs. Mm -hmm. there are other examples when there are no universal lines? Mm -hmm. yeah. In the chordal graph, the, like if you take just a click, take a complete graph, yes. it's, it's chordal, and any line is just two points. So. Yes, we cannot go straight to everything is universal. Then Schwatal on, on his own, he proved that any graph of diameter 2 has the DBE. So it's kind of, it's like graphs of diameter 1 are complete graphs. And so we just take one step further. But it's quite a technical, well, he, he proved more than that. He proved that any metric space of diameter 2, of 0, 1, 2 metric space, they have this DBE property. Then it was proven by Abulker and Kapadia. So it's all in 2015, but there is a chronology into this, basically. It's just everything was published in the same year for some reason. They say that they proved that distance hereditary graphs, which contains the diameter two graphs, or uh, satisfy the DBE. And so they had these results for chordal graphs and distance hereditary. So basically, Abulker was, at the time he was in Chile, and they uh, managed to prove that core, the class of chordal graphs plus some gluing operations that I won't go into details, they also satisfy this, uh, this uh, DBE property. So this somehow unify all these results right here. Uh, next step, so this, is, this might seem kind of a weird class to study. B splits graph. So a bipartite graph is two stable sets and something in between, anything. B splits graph are three stable sets, two of which have all the edges. This is a complete bipartite graph here. And then I have anything there any, and anything there. So it's a class which is slightly bigger than bipartite graphs. We will see in a minute why it has some it's just one step to, to the main question. And so basically we observe that this chordal plus gluing, they are all HHD free, meaning they have no dominoes induced. So dominoes is this graph over there. No house, a house is a square and a roof. And no hole, a hole is a cycle of length at least five. So these graphs here, all avoid these guys. But it's not equal to HHD free graphs. So one of the open questions that Vashek told us is, well, can we say anything about HHD free? And with Pierre and uh, our uh, Chilean colleagues, we recently, like, we still just submitted the paper, but we're pretty confident on the, on the proof. We proved a bit more than that. We just dropped the D and say that every HHD free graphs have this property. And actually, I don't know if it, we don't have any count. What we prove is much more than DBE because we just consider lines which are generated by an edge or by two vertices at distance two. So we stick to a very small set of generators and we show that we have sufficiently uh, a big number of lines or a universal ones. So it might be actually it's still it's an open question whether one one more open question can we strengthen the, the hypothesis and say any graph either there is something universal or the number of lines generated by pairs at distance one or two is large enough. Okay, so this is basically the figure of what we know. So there is many questions there, so we don't know for diameter three. We don't know for comparability graph. So comparability graph is give, pick your favorite uh, partial order. And so the vertices of your graph will be the elements of your order. And the edges will be, is all these two elements comparable? You can somehow see your Haas diagram there, but you have the transitivity edges in, uh, added. The B splits are some 
subset of these comparability graphs. Once again, we speak about the metric. So, like the metric induced by those guys is definitely different to the partial order. Okay, I mean, if I have this order, then in my comparability graph, those two guys will be at distance two because there is an edge from here to there and, a, and an edge from here to there. So the distance or messing around. So it's, but it's still a, quite a, I, I mean, there should be something to be said there, but we, we still don't know. So here you get one open question, two open questions. Here you can choose which H you want to remove and look for H-free graphs and try to find something interesting. Ah, there's another question coming. Oh. Okay, so this is a picture for graphs, like for the exact situation. Concerning graphs, which techniques is used in the proof? Okay. So there are different different techniques. So here is an obvious case that we already seen. Here is well, most of the case it's structural techniques that you, we we try to see. Well, uh, let's look at some potential counter example. Then we have some close some close up situation like we have a cut vertex or we have uh, this thing which is induced and here like i think this is so here is uh, basically counting we just uh, see we try to find we look at how lines are defined and we try to find the the the, the good number of lines and there is several cases that are studied but Basically, we manage our way. It's pretty straightforward, but boring. It's not the most interesting thing. Here, I think it's more interesting because the counting is made in a very different way as usual. This is like somehow we had to think a bit differently. And there is this discharging proof. So we somehow assign a line to each vertex in a very weird manner, or sometimes we assign some half lines to some things. And in the end, you just make the sum of everything. And I, I mean, that's, I, I, I won't be, I could speak about it, but it would be kind of, we, we just, it's a discharging method. I don't know if people are uh, familiar with it. You have your lines, you assign them to vertices in a weird way. And you prove that every vertex has received at least a quantity one, so the number of lines in the beginning is at least one. It has this number of vertices. It's, well, this, is, this was the first time we used these techniques. Here and there is structural techniques. And I have just, next slide is some questions which could help. Like if I have two graphs which satisfy the DBE, so we know that they have this property. And I just glue them on one vertex. So I identify a vertex on G1, I identify a vertex on G2, and I want to say, well, is it true that if I glue them, then this graph has the DBE? It's an open question. We don't know if it's true. So here is your new open question. I mean, if, if you get these kind of, this is like the other way to look at the picture, like here, the one, the slide before, we take the, our favorite class of graph and try to do some specific techniques for this. Here, we try to be much more general. Or right? it's kind of what properties should satisfy a minimal counterexample. If I manage to prove this, that I know, then I know that a minimal counterexample cannot have a cut vertex. But it's still an open question. So this we don't know. One more open question. This we don't know neither. If I take a graph and I have one vertex, and I duplicate it. So there is two ways of duplicating a vertex. So I make somehow a twin for him, and either I can connect these two twins or I can not connect them. We call them false twins or true twins. For, so now you have two questions for one, because we don't even know if false duplication or true duplication preserves the DBE. So these are the kind of questions that are uh, on the grill, but still we don't manage to find a way to get through it. Okay, so this was for the exact question. Now you can think of asymptotically study. 
if I have the number of vertices that goes very, very wide, I take, they have this proof in 2016, and basically they prove that for any class with a fixed diameter, so if you fix a, a, an infinite family of graphs, but you know that the diameter is bounded by some value. Sorry? No, I mean for any d, fix a number, fix 12, and I give me an infinite family of graphs such that all of them have diameter less than 12. So being infinite means at some point you will have some large number of vertices in there. Then the number of lines is at least like of order n to the fourth third. So it's much more than what we want actually. We want just n, and here they said, well, you can have more than n. What so, is uh, omega means? What omega, omega means uh, it's a lower bound on the order of the, there is a function of like the number of lines is bigger than some constant. Inverse line. of O. Sorry? Inverse of O. Yes, inverse of O. So, so it, this, this uh, coefficient C will depend on D? It will depend on D, da. It's for a fixed D. I get at some point something which is more than n to the four thirds. Sorry, but uh, maybe I missed something. At the previous slide, uh, it was said that the case of diameter three is open. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean this is an asymptotical result. This tells us. Oh, I see. I see. If you I see. if you want that to. That is about all graphs. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's, uh, so if you want yeah, to prove yeah, diameter yeah, three, yeah, yeah, yeah. it this basically tells you that. If your graph has more than 80 vertices and diameter 3, so, so for, 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 for you're happy. D, you should analyze a finite, a finite set of things. Yeah, if you're really good huge, at programming, yeah. you can do that, but I we see, are not I that see, good. Okay. So basically to the point this, that asymptotically, maybe it's true that the number of lines is much more than what we need. To the point that the, like asking for a linear number of lines is maybe downright misleading. Maybe we actually of touching more. So this is open. Like if you have a large graph, can we can you say that either you have a universal line or like more than linear number of lines? It cannot be improved. You, we cannot hope for a better exponent there. So this is proven by the multipartite graph with n to the two third potatoes of this side. I don't well, I had a slide for the proof of this, but I mean, so if you have k bags of size t, and it's a multipartite complete graph, so all the edges are between any two bags. All these are stable sets. If I take two points which are here, they are at distance two, so they are at distance two, and they will grab, like in the line, you can convince yourself that basically they will grab everything but the rest of the people here. So all those guys will be in between these two points. So you get for free k times so it's k bags of size t. You have k times t choose two lines. The other situation is taking two points in different bags. And you will check that these two points, they generate a line, which is basically the whole set of these two potatoes here. I don't want to use your energy on that, but you get k choose two lines. And then you want to minimize those things. So if you have n. You take t being n to the alpha, k being n to the 1 minus alpha. You try to minimize your stuff. And for alpha equals 1 third, you get the minimum. So we cannot hope for better. But it's still open. I'm sorry, and maybe return to the previous slide. This Any one. Question. Maybe we can characterize graphs which are universal lines, no? Uh, I mean, we don't. Very you have different ways of having different uh, universal lines. And so it's not easy to see when I look to the graph. Versus ah, no, it's definitely not easy. I mean, way from easy. Yeah, way away from easy. What? Uh, what? Uh, so, uh, the minimum number, of, actually, this gives rise to another conjecture, which is the minimum number of lines, if I have endpoints. It is all we suppose that it was. It is always achieved by some complete multipartite graph, and it's been. So this somehow tells us that if we manage to prove this, 
we just need to look at that and we have our situation that we want. It's been checked up to n equal 12. And for n equals 13, we don't know. So if you're good at programming, just go for 13. Anyway, so I will uh, switch. Sort of, sort of the of the formulation of the previous conjecture. Yes. Yeah, well, it's. It's a, it's a bit more because the, the previous conjecture is uh, asymptotical and this one is telling for every n the optimum is for those multipartite thing. Uh, okay, I will switch to the, so we've been talking about graphs for a while. I will be quite faster for the rest, so bear with me. Uh, you will be out before 15 minutes for sure. Okay, so Euclidean case, we know it's okay. We, we know it for sure. What about L1? So I have this situation where a line, so now the line is all the people between those two points, all the people which are after this one, and all the people which are before this one. Question, is it true? So we have two types of lines, the, the general one. This is like the one we think about usually. If two points have the same coordinate, we have a weird situation where the, the line is basically the whole half space over there, the whole half space over there, and this weird segment here. So if we forbid this situation, so if you're given a set of points in a general positions, Cantor and Patkosh, they proved that non-degenerate, so with not these weird lines, they satisfy the DBE for R2. It's an open question whether you can drop this non-degeneracy. So if I want to remove this part of the sentence, we don't know the, the answer. Up to now, by private communication, so I didn't see that proof, but Kantor sent a, like Vashek Shvatal is taking care of knowing everything about everything. So he told us that we have a proof for n over two. So they managed, she managed to prove that I have at least n over two lines. Question, you can, can you switch the two to NED? It's still open also. Okay, so we have a bunch of questions for this L1 matrix. Uh, the asymptotical way of speaking about, so the proof, the same, the same authors in the same paper, so they proved that for graphs we have at least n to the four third, and with the same techniques, it's basically in a more large framework, they have this lower bound of square root of n. So it's not satisfying the conjecture at all, but I mean, it's the best lower bound we have in an asymptotical way. So if, if anyone can prove n to the 3 fourth, we are happy. We come back to the theorem of Schwatal, I told you already that, and if I, I told that graphs of diameter to have the DBE, it's just a corollary of this, that any metric space on 0, 1, 2 distances satisfies the DBE. Then, so this is all I want to say for metrics. Now if I switch to pseudometric between nets, so we told you that, uh, I told you that this is the obvious thing for metrics. We call this pseudometric, and actually the Euclidean case, so question, open question, is it true for all pseudometric? We don't know. Actually the Euclidean case satisfies more than those three, those four uh, axioms. So this is some other ways of some other transitivities. Basically, they say, if I have, okay, I will try to, if I have u, v, w, so I have a shortest path from u to w going through v, and I have v, w to x, then I have the whole line. So this is what we call the outer transitivities. If I have, like, v, w is fixed, if I have something on the right, something on the left, then we have a line together. This is called uh, inner transitivity. So I fix, no, ah, this is, if I have u, ah, the fork, this is the weird transitivity. We call this the, the fork one. If I have uv and w and uv and x, then they must leave on the same line. This is true for the Euclidean case. If I have this and I have this, okay, you don't see anything, forget about this. And this is the third. This is the inner transitivity. If I have u and x which are fixed, I have two points which are in between them, then they all live in the same line. And Abulker managed to prove that if we drop 
even if we drop this, then any pseudometric betweenness satisfying M4 and M5 is DBE. And so the natural question is, what if we drop even M5, or if we drop, it's so like taking steps to the main result. So once open, uh, two, uh, two open questions for free. And the last thing, whoa. Now let's speak of betweennesses in general. Basically, when I'm speaking about a line, I don't really care about who is between the two other guys. Because if I take two points, I will take any third point which makes some relation with the two of them. So it's collinearity, which is the interesting word here. So give me a set of uh, uh, betweenness, and I can build a hypergraph. So I have a set of vertices and all the edges or the, the triplets, which are collinear. And now the line is nothing but A and B plus all the Cs which form a hyper edge with them. And the structural results that we had are the following. If I have a three uniform hypergraph and I take four points, it will be finished in five minutes. Uh, then we have five situations. Either they don't have any alignment, so it's four points with no hyper edged at all, or they have one alignment, so there is one hyper edge, and up to isomorphism, they all, all look the same. Or they have two, and once again, if I take two, three, two hyper edges of size three, they must intersect into two points, so up to isomorphism, it's always the same situation. Or they have three, or they have four, and all of those are up to, uh, up to isomorphism, it's always the same thing. So, okay, that's not really enlightening, but if we, if we look at the Euclidean case, once again, we cannot have all the situation. If I take four points in R2, either they are not in any collinearity situation, so it's the zero case, or I have three points which are collinear and one point which, which is out, so they have just one hyper edge, or I have all of them. So basically, the Euclidean case is a 0, 1, 4 hypergraph. So any four points, they induced 0, 1, or 4. And what we proved is that if you take uh, any hypergraph with triplets, and if any four points induce 0, 1, 3, or 4, so it's even wider than just the, the, the hyper, uh, the Euclidean case is somewhere there, then it always has the DBE. And in the same paper, we had this uh, 0, 2, 4, we had some variations on this. We have our smallest counterexample, which is living up there. So this is a betweenness on 11 vertices, 11 elements, which does not satisfy the DBE, so it has no universal lines and 10 distinct lines. We managed to somehow corner down the border to those guys, or those situations. So here we have for free three open questions, which is what is the situation over there, over there, and over there. And I think I'm up to the end of this. So main question, once again, how many lines for endpoints? We still expect many, hopefully. And just some advertising, this paper from Schwatal, which appeared last year, well, now two years ago now, is a large survey where there is almost all the questions that I talked to you about, maybe more than that. I mean, it's, the paper has 27 open problems. So I think I didn't make it to cite them all. It's in a series of book, which is my favorite graphs problem or something like that. So it's a, if you want uh, more details about what I said, you can either ask me or go read this, or do both, actually. And when you type uh, paintings, points, and lines, you get to this one in Google. So it's lines from points to points, and it's basically this sentence written many times in a weird situation. And I guess it's Solomon Levitt, and uh, I think it has a uh, DBE for sure because it's the Euclidean case. So that's it. I think I've, yes, this is the end. No, that's my last slide. Thank you.